for joining us for tonight's NAC home program about James Hemmings. My name is Laura Daly and I'm co-chair of the Roundtable Committee. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This includes exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. This event will be recorded and posted within 24 hours on the NAC's YouTube channel for you to share with your friends or watch it again. Tonight, we will learn about James Hemmings, a master chef, culinary innovator, teacher, valet, patriot, and one of Thomas Jefferson's slaves. There will be a Q&A after the presentation, so please use the question function for anything that you would like to ask the presenter. And now I would like to introduce you to Doug Rice, who will introduce our presenter for the evening. Doug is a member of the Roundtable Committee, and he's also a painter and a sculptor, and he's had two shows at the National Arts Club. So please welcome Doug Rice. Hello, everyone. Uh, my friend Ashbel McElveen is a culinary history sleuth. He's not only a four-star international chef, he's a culinary entrepreneur, a documentary filmmaker, and a globetrotter who has told me he samples some of the best food in the world. You know, long before people, uh, long before thank you for your service became a hollow cliche, after years of work in the U.S. Navy, Ashbel is proudest of being made an official plank holder of the U.S. Cursorage, along with Alma Powell, Colin Powell's wife. He is also the only American chef commissioned to cook in a royal park in London. Upon returning to America in 2014, he founded the James Hemmings Society. In 2017, he opened Ashbell's Smoked Meats and Seafood in Philadelphia. For the record, I have a piece of his smoked duck breast in my refrigerator right now, and it is fabulous. <laughs> I'd like to introduce my friend, Ashbel McElveen. Doug, Doug, well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I am delighted to be here and uh, to talk about James Hem Hemmings, an incredible uh, American who is still, unfortunately, a ghost in our kitchens, still. Um, could we start the slideshow? James Hemmings was uh, born in the 1765. He died in 1801. And uh, he is America's culinary founding father. He was a valet, maitre d'hotel teacher, and, uh, and the patriot in my research uh, discovered that he was uh, quite an extraordinary individual and still is being overshadowed by the myths of Thomas Jefferson as the founding foodie. Um, James, uh, on returning to America with Jefferson after five years in Paris, James Hemings is famously cooked the dinner, the assumption, what is called the assumption dinner um, between uh, Madison, Jefferson, and Hamilton. And uh, uh, Jefferson engineered the, the dinner um, after meeting Hamilton one day at 26 Broadway where George Washington's house was. And he invited him to dinner. And uh, we have the next slide. This is the Fry Market. Uh, it was established in um, 1699. And it was uh, Lower Manhattan Market. Um, and eventually the markets moved up to Peck Slip. But this was the original market. And so to prepare for that dinner, 
James had to actually go and shop in the Fry Market. This is at the end of Maiden Lane, uh, Maiden Lane and the East River. We have the next slide. And um, this is a view of Wall Street. And the building in the center is the slave market um, because Wall Street had uh, the, the biggest slave market in New York at the time. And James Hemings, to prepare for that dinner and to prepare his incredible dessert, he had to walk past these buildings to get to the old British ice house, which was located uh, in a uh, city park plaza, it, where the old, where the new municipal building is, used to be the, the British barracks. And it was one of two ice houses in, uh, in America at the time. And uh, he, uh, he is responsible for providing the salve to get bitter enemies, Hamilton and Jefferson, to agree. And the, the dinner uh, is called the Assumption Dinner because the purpose of the dinner was to settle the Revolutionary War debt. And the, it was agreed that the states would pick up the debts. And of course, Jefferson and Madison being from Virginia, they made sure that Virginia paid the less, the least amount of, of, of the charges. And um, and this is known as uh, the assumption dinner because they uh, assumed the debt and um, the, agreed that Washington, D.C. would be the capital of the United States after um, 10 years or so in Philadelphia. And that was a, a monumental nod to uh, the Southern slave owners, actually, because they felt uncomfortable with New York being uh, the capital of America. Um, it, uh, if we have the next slide, James, uh, continued to cook in Philadelphia, Monticello, and in, uh, New York. And, uh, because of his skills at the stove, Jefferson used his skills as a political weapon. Whenever he needed some uh, uh, opinions to be swayed his way, he would actually invite people to dinner for James's incredible skills. And a little bit later on, we'll be able to show you um, how he learned some of those skills and where he learned some of those skills in France. But um, it's important to know that fine food developed in Virginia plantation houses like Monticello and James Madison's house and George Washington's uh, 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 plantation. And from there, it went to Philadelphia by enslaved chefs like James Hemings and Hercules Washington, um, bringing that real um, kind of an extension of of Henry VIII's groaning board table um, ended up being um, uh, cajoled and, and stirred by the Africans to create a real cuisine. And it was the finest food in America. So fine food developed in America through with the African hand, taking all of the bits and pieces from Native America from the English, Irish, and Scottish, from the French and the Germans. And they stirred up a cuisine, a fine cuisine. And that's the cuisine that went first to an urban center in Philadelphia and then on to, um, on to uh, New York and other places. It, um, it, it is... Uh, really interesting that Jefferson definitely didn't want him to get away. So can we have the next slide, please? This is the contract that uh, Jefferson made with James to, uh, for his, in exchange of his freedom, 
Jefferson wanted him to teach his brother, uh, Peter, everything he learned in France. And James accepted that. And with that acceptance and by this contract, that was the first cooking school in America. That enslaved kitchen at Monticello, which is the source of, of iconic foods that James Hemings brought back to America from France, macaroni and cheese, French fries, firm French ice cream, creme brulee, whipped cream, meringues, and meringues were so important among, among other things, but uh, the meringues um, was a key to his uh, dessert at the Assumption Dinner, which was warm pastry stuffed with vanilla ice cream. And it took me two years to figure out that it was the meringue that insulated the ice cream. And uh, it was it was just proof of the skills that he learned from master um, pastry chefs in France. And he paid with his own money after he had training at Chantilly. So this was incredible. And uh, can we go to the next slide? This is an inventory of the kitchen utensils that Monticello in the only document that we have surviving in James Hemings's hand. And it's written in perfect English and perfect French. And um, it just speaks to the depth of, uh, of acclamation that James had over the five years he was in France, particularly very, very different from Jefferson's uh, time during those five years. And can we have the next uh, slide? This is the kitchen door on that promontory overlooking uh, Jefferson's garden at Monticello. And this is key to the transfer of knowledge among enslaved people. Every visitor visiting Jefferson was accompanied by their uh, household slaves and, and uh, people to, uh, that were valets and drivers and et cetera. This was the place where they would come to, to eat and to drink. They could get water and, and their dinners were all served through this doorway. And it, it had a Dutch door, half door at the bottom to keep everybody from coming in. But the key was that Jefferson purposely rebuilt the 1790 kitchen with bricks standing up instead of laying down. It was an ostentatious move, and he knew that everybody would comment on how expensive that floor was and the fact that he had his French-trained chef, James Hemings, not cooking in the fireplace, but cooking on the new potager stove. And even though the potager stoves had been in America for a while, there were one or two. Um, one was at the governor's mansion in, um, in Williamsburg, but no one knew how to use it. No one knew how to use it. And James Hemings could stand there and defy, um, uh, look like defying magic because the potager stove just cooked on um, hot coals. And so there was no venting for smoke. And that must have been a real spectacle to see food cooking um, on a, a, a contraption like the uh, potager stove. And it's the great, great grandfather of the stove we're cooking on today. That's how influential um, that uh, bit of, of James Hemings just doing what he was taught. Um, and this, this transfer of knowledge uh, is so important because that's how plantations, all the various plantations that he would actually visit with Jefferson, but also the people visiting would stand at that window and in a room that's uh, 12 by 15, 
You can hear everything that's being said, even if it's not directed to you. And, uh, and you know, I remember being admonished by my great aunt, stop looking at my mouth when I'm talking, when I'm showing you something, look at what I'm doing, which is the key to this transfer of knowledge, which literally went from plantation to plantation and became a part of the food ways and informed people like uh, the great Virginia chef, Edna Lewis. And um, uh, that's vital for this, um, for this transfer of knowledge and, and, and how, uh, how these uh, dishes were, were actually passed on. And uh, I'd love to, I'm looking forward to tell you a little bit more about his time in Paris, because that was incredible. Uh, could we have the first slide? Thank you. This is a copy of the, uh, the type of ship, the Ceres, that Jefferson and James and his daughter Patsy arrived in France at Le Havre. Um, and it, it's so telling that as soon as they arrived, Jefferson, being the planter <laughs> white man who was used to servants making arrangements, he gave James money to arrange for transport. James not only went and arranged transport to Rouen and then on to Paris, but he bought change back to Jefferson. That was James's first bit of, I'm in a new place, I'm in a, I have a new language to learn. And apparently Jefferson had, told, had taught him a few phrases on the ship to uh, start to acclimate him to the French language. Uh, well, James excelled at that. And, uh, and just an indication of how much he was uh, walking into liberty. Can we have the next slide? This is Chateau Chantilly. It's an aerial view of the chateau. This is where James Henning, Hemings had his training. And uh, it's famous for the chef in um, Francois Vatel. Uh, and in um, 17, uh, no, 1647, uh, he was uh, cooking for the King of France, Louis XV. The, the and, um, and he had arranged all kinds of celebrations and a huge banquet that was culminating with an incredible fish course. And it was a banquet for 2,000. And Chantilly would regularly have a minimum of 300 people to feed three times a day and up to 1,300 in residence. Um, so it was a city onto itself. Can we have the next slide? Yes. Uh, the optics for James was incredible for an enslaved person to come to another country. And this is Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, an incredible young man, a uh, violin virtuoso. And uh, his father, George, was a noble who had the honor of dressing the king. It's uh, an honorary title, but uh, politically, very good because you could get close to the king. Um, so he was educated in France. He was the best fencer and the best shot. He was the Michael Jackson of his time. Everybody knew the king, the queen, and the best fencer in France. He was the best shot. And no American other than Benjamin Franklin mentioned even meeting him. And he said that he was an extraordinary young man. He was also the music teacher of Marie Antoinette. Can we have the next slide, please? This is General Thomas Dumas. 
And he is the father of um, Alexander Dumas, the great French writer. And he was a general in the French army. And uh, ironically, along with um, Joseph Boulogne and uh, General Dumas, they organized the first all black regiment in the French army. Yes. And it, 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 it was, I can't even imagine what he must have thought. Can we have the next slide? This is a shot of the kitchen at Chantilly. These are the same kitchens that were there that James trained in. It's now a restaurant and that is a potager stove. Um, and uh, it uh, definitely allowed you to not cook in the fireplace and make fine sauces and um, and et cetera. And that was the, the whole um, difference in, in the cooking. And this was considered, the, the kitchen at Chantilly was considered the best kitchen in France, even better than the food at Versailles. And uh, Vital, when he did that incredible dinner, uh, when the when the fish course didn't arrive, he committed suicide. And um, it, uh, it, uh, it, it's been a, a very famous kitchen from then. Um, it, uh, ironically, uh, Joseph uh, Boulogne was a frequent dinner guest at Chantilly. And uh, he went to the kitchen one day to complain that the fish course was overcooked. And he was attacked by one of the chefs with a knife. He quickly disarmed the guy and, uh, and went back to dinner to await the properly cooked fish. And I can't imagine what those optics were for an enslaved person coming from Virginia. Um, can we have the next slide, please? This is Antoine Parmentier, and he uh, did experiments on, um, on finding some uh, cheap food sources, and he was uh, growing the white potato um, and, uh, as a cheap food source. But because it was a nightshade item, many people were very hesitant to, to actually eat the potato. But he arranged all of these dinners, um, which some of which he invited Ben Franklin to, um, to taste the uh, product of the potato. And this was all done uh, within 10, 15 miles of Chantilly. So it, it's, it's not hard pressed to understand that those potatoes went first to that kitchen um, to be then turned into all of the things that uh, that uh, uh, we we commonly now associate it with the potato. Um, and uh, next slide. And uh, and and here are the French fries, of course, which is global. James Hemings didn't invent French fries, but he was the first to make them in America, and it was from that small slave kitchen at Monticello, that this, this became a global food along with macaroni and cheese. Go with the next slide. Whipped cream. Uh, Chateau Chanty is known as, as the birthplace of whipped cream, but that is not so. It is just because it's so famous, the chateau and the food there, that when whipped cream was first presented there, after being, I think, invented in Switzerland somewhere, um, it quickly took on the name Crème Chantilly, and that's the name it still has in French. Next slide, please. Ice cream. At Chantilly, for 40 years before James Hemings got there, the Crème at Chantilly, which was dairy, 
was known for doing chaise monte, uh, mounted pieces of ice cream um, in a sculpture and then serving that sculpture. And, uh, and to do that, you had to have firm ice cream. And the difference in the, in the firmness and the flavor it, with the French ice cream is the addition of the eggs, which stabilizes the custard and, and helps in the, in the freezing. So James Hemmings brought French vanilla ice cream to America. And, uh, and at the time, America had the ice cream, of course, but it wasn't a consistency to be stacked like that on a cone. It was most the consistency of a, a firmish milkshake. And that was what the, the normal presentation of ice cream in America was. So this, this was important, an important um, situation, especially if you like ice cream, which I do. Next one, please. Uh, meringues. Meringues um, or your lemon meringue pie, your baked Alaska. Um, even though some Italian chefs at Delmonico in New York in the uh, 1840s claim to have discovered <laughs> uh, baked Alaska and, uh, and meringues and using meringues to insulate. But James Hemings had done it so many years before in 1790 in that famous dinner in New York City. Um, it, uh, it, it definitely is one of, the, one of the things that weren't in America at the time. And I've been doing a whole bunch of research. I'd love to have somebody show me where there were meringues in, uh, in America before um, 1790. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, five years that they were there, the whole decade of the uh, 1780s in France was an incredible food revolution. It was, well, prepared mustard was, was um, invented. Um, olive oil became, uh, became an active use in the, uh, in, preparation of cuisine, foie gras was invented. Um, a myriad of, of exciting times for food. And, and uh, it was the decade that for the first time, female chefs were honored. And uh, as a matter of fact, Jefferson's first uh, chef when he, had, when he was in his first house in Paris, was a female named Anna, and James uh, studied a bit under her and a bit under uh, a caterer called Bro when he first arrived before going to the Chateau Chantilly. And um, Jefferson had dispatched uh, uh, a friend of his, his lawyer, um, to negotiate James's contract at Chantilly. Uh, and he failed to do it. And James stepped in and settled the price that Jefferson would pay. And it was another example of James stepping out and, um, and realizing that in the most, in one of the biggest cities, uh, second only to London, 600,000 people lived in Paris when he arrived there. And there were 3,000 Black people there. And he knew, as everybody else did, that he could have declared his freedom just by walking into the Admiral de Court. And I've all, I'd always wondered, I said, why wouldn't he do that? Because he, he could go to Kathy Alsop, the, the first restaurant, which Jefferson and Franklin went to. He was able to go to the theater without any kind of uh, hesitation at all. Um, he could pay his own way, and he did. And he was, it was quite urbane. He um, hired a tutor um, to teach him the French that was spoken at court. Could we have the next slide, please? 
This is Bathide Dolion. She is quite an individual. <laughs> um, she uh, was exiled from uh, Versailles for having a child out of wedlock. And she was uh, interested in the occult and, and science and um, so many things. She actually opened the first Masonic Lodge by a woman in Paris. And she's the one who created the little farm, that the, the little hameau that's at uh, Versailles is copied from the hameau that Bathy did at Chantilly. And she was uh, uh, known all over Europe for her witty conversation in French. And, uh, and I, uh, I thought, well, why would uh, James uh, be learning French, but not just French because he spoke fluent French, um, because he, he literally worked and lived amongst the French. And, uh, and I can tell you, I was there as a 19 year old. And, and as a, when I arrived in France back in the early uh, 70s, if you didn't speak French, you were almost a deaf mute. <laughs> they, there was no ESL for another language. You, you had to express yourself in French. And, uh, and so James living, um, and then uh, eventually taking over. Can we have the next, uh, next slide? This is uh, the floor plan of Jefferson's house on the Champs-Élysées. It's the Hotel Longiac. And this is where James um, literally held court. Um, Jefferson's salons were always in English because he had uh, little confidence in, in speaking French. I'm sure he understood French fluently, but he was uncomfortable speaking. So all of his salons were in French, I mean, in English. And, um, and the uh, people that attended them were the, you know, the darlings of the Enlightenment, uh, Rousseau, Didier, um, Voltaire. And, uh, and Jefferson never mentioned to any of them that he owned 500 people, 500 humans. And he didn't mention it because the Enlightenment was virulently anti-slavery. And, uh, and he hid that status. And James Hemings did not declare his freedom, which he could have, um, and returned to America because it would have destroyed the American delegation overnight. They would have been pariahs, absolute social pariahs overnight. And in the end, it was his love for Virginia and love of family that James returned to America in slavery. And um, yeah, that is, uh, it, it is an interesting story. And we're looking forward to, to actually share much more of that um, with everybody. And uh, there's a documentary soon to be released and it's called Ghost in the Kitchen. And, um, and uh, we're looking forward to doing some episodic series on James Henry's life because he had an extraordinary life and uh, was, was just a, a pillar of, uh, of, of culinary uh, ingenuity and personal style. Um, next slide, please. Well, we are the James Heming Society, and we're looking for uh, donations to support our initiatives. I'm very, very happy to, um, to announce. Next slide, please. James Heming Society and Collective Food Works 
has created a culinary prep program. And it's the first culinary prep program from ages um, six to 18. Can we have the next slide, please? And this is, um, you know, some photographs from the, uh, from the classes. Next slide. Next one. Yes. This is the, this, well, the next one. Next slide. The children, I happen to have the honor of being at the Trey Whitfield School in Brooklyn. And the enthusiasm of these children for learning both the history and the how-to is brilliant. And, uh, and we're uh, excited beyond belief that uh, we're, we've uh, working with the uh, collective uh, works to uh, uh, expand this, this educational program. And, uh, and by the way, collective works were one of the few uh, organizations that fed thousands of people during the pandemic, during the height of the pandemic. Um, they're the ones that stepped in and made sure that people in Brownsville had food to eat. So it is um, uh, an honor to be working with them in, in um, um, highlighting James's legacy, but also um, bringing awareness to the incredible contributions of the nameless enslaved people who um, contributed so much to the food um, and food waste history of America. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to, um, to really uh, expanding the conversation on, um, uh, as, as many um, culinary historians um, are doing already. And, uh, and we are, it's for the first time, we're getting a first look at who did what. And, uh, and with clear eyes. And I am excited about this uh, educational prospect, um, but also um, about the building uh, a living library of recipes. Um, so we're um, we're uh, grateful if you can uh, find it in your hearts to support us in these initiatives. And um, and I think that is uh, the end. Yes. And there's uh, Latoya Meters who who has created this program to, and, is, um, and is a director of the James Hammond Society. So we are definitely, definitely excited for the future. So um, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that uh, I know that the documentary Ghost in America's Kitchen um, is being released in the next couple of months. And, uh, and we're totally excited that, uh, that things are going so well. So, Laura, do we have time for a QA? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And I have some questions. Some are okay. a little macabre, but I'll ask them anyway. Okay. Uh, well, we'll, let, we'll go to the easy ones first. Um, what was the relationship between James and Sally? Sally was James's uh, younger sister. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I guess uh, the culinary expertise was mostly James and Sally. Oh, no, no, yeah, James, uh, although when Sally was in um, France, she did attend the uh, uh, Parmentier uh, College for girls that uh, um, Jefferson's daughters were in. And, uh, and she went to parties with them, so she had a... Um, uh, a definite uh, life too in uh, in France, and um, um, it's uh, where we're, I, I shy away from talking about Sally and Jefferson because uh, you know people just want to know the salacious details, I know. and it's just like I just like, no no go 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 someplace else. We're, we're going to talk about the food. All right, somebody asked uh, if. You know James's mac and cheese recipe. 
Oh my God. No. <laughs> I wish but, I wish okay. I did. I wish I did. But I will tell you that um, pastas came from from North Africa, actually, to Europe. And um, so the hard pastas were were in, you know, being served at the Chantilly for 50, 60 years before James Hammond got there. And uh, and having, you know, cheese with noodles is very is a very typical French preparation. I would suppose that maybe the type of cheese might have been different because of his experience. But. Oh, absolutely. The, the cheeses, well, the cheeses in France were absolutely superb. Right. And uh, I, I would would rather have had the, the early mac and cheeses in France and not in America. Yeah, yeah. Not, nothing out of a box. No, thank you. No, no. <laughs> Um, but somebody did ask if there were any surviving recipes that were his own creation. Well, there are. Well, there, there, there's one thing that I call the greatest culinary theft in uh, publishing history, and it's the Virginia Housewife Cookbook, where all of these recipes uh, are attributed to Jefferson's relatives by his relative, Mary Randolph. Uh, and uh, I choose to believe that somewhere in Baltimore, James's papers are going to be found because he's quite literate. And um, uh, when he was, I don't believe he committed suicide in Baltimore because at the time, he his clothes, just his clothes from Paris was finer than the richest people in Baltimore. Yeah, and there for him to even go out to shop, it would have been a black man, a free black man, in the finest clothes in Baltimore. And uh, and you can imagine what that would have been in 1801. Yeah. yeah, you know, so. there was a question from somebody about his cause of death because ap yeah. apparently this whole thing of suicide has some traction. Well, it, okay. it has traction because, you know, because we, we're not seeing these people still. We're not seeing these individuals. And and, uh, and a lot of Black men uh, understand that. Um, and uh, I believe and uh, being a southerner and being raised in the Jim Crow South, the the modern extension of chattel slavery, yes. um, I um, I I knew that I know that the hostilities, some of those hostilities, still plague us today. Um, so I don't think that uh, he was suicidal. He was independent. He had gone back to France. Um, when he got his freedom, so he was he was clearly not uh, trying to uh, just commit suicide. He was looking to see where a thirty year old would settle. Yeah. So this somewhat relates to finding any of his documentation or recipes, or what, since he was so uh, prolific in his his uh, writing, what. Where are his relatives? Where's his his family tree? Are there current people that? Oh yes, this could is he have huge. passed it all down to somebody? Yeah. No, no, there nothing got passed down through the Hemings family of his recipes, but I believe that somewhere, because I'm a, a fan of the Antiques Roadshow, somewhere <laughs> a satchel of his papers are are, are going to be discovered. Um, because in 1801, you had the, what was really precious to people that, you know, people that couldn't read was something written on paper. Right. And so that wasn't something that people would, would normally just throw away. And so I believe and I pray that someday we'll find that satchel of, satchel of his recipes. But in the meantime, um, the influence that he's uh, had on global foodways is incredible. So um, I uh, choose to be positive and um, 
and look and be forward looking and inclusive like the uh, James Henning Society is. And, um, and we're you know, inviting people from all over to uh, join us and, uh, and uh, celebrate America's culinary founding father. Well, I did put the, um, your URL for the James Henning Society in the chat box. And I can see that you know, people are grabbing onto it and are very interested. But um, there were numerous people who wanted to know if there are any books or articles that you could re you could recommend, so that they can learn more about him? Well, uh, there's not much written about him, but um, uh, there's um, and that Gordon Reed's book on uh, James on the Hemingses, and the Hemings family is the first family of fine dining with service and food. That extended family is just incredible. And, mm -hmm. and we haven't actually um, really, we're just the, scraping the dust off of the reality of, of James's extended family, who actually, even though Jefferson refused to write him a letter that James wanted to be, to come and be the chef of the White House. James held out to be uh, treated as a free man with a letter of invitation. Jefferson refused to write a letter to a black man. Even having gone through all of that experience with James uh, being abroad and James being half brother to his wife, Martha, um, he didn't write the letter. And James, with incredible courage, he stood up to the most a uh, powerful man in his universe and said, no, you will not call me like you did when I was your slave. And with that dignity, um, I am really convinced that he didn't take his own life. Yeah. Um, a few more questions. Let's okay. See. Uh, what culinary delights did Jefferson bring to the White House that were really Hemings? And did, well, guess... it's it's very interesting that that one uh, dish of warm pastry stuffed with vanilla ice cream, when Jefferson actually wrote a letter to a white Frenchman who had who had been in America for about 15 years. So he missed, he missed the whole revolution in food in France and all of the new techniques. But uh, Edith Fawcett and Francis Hearn, um, who were standing in that kitchen when James Hemings was teaching his brother Peter everything he knew, they went and taught Julianne, the French chef that Jefferson hired at the White House, the style that Jefferson preferred eating was half Virginian and half French, which was a fusion that James Hemings created in Paris. And that was also George Washington's preferred way to eat, was half French and half Virginian. Um, so the influence is incredible, is palpable. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to producing a, a docu-series on James Hemings' life in Paris because it was monumental. Sure. And to have, uh, have given up that amount of personal freedom for the sake of, of the country uh, needs to be recognized. Um, speaking about the documentary, because you, you mentioned a documentary and then a, yes. a series. Are they yes. two separate things or one and the same? Yeah, two separate things. The okay, documentary, so, is, it literally just finished. Okay. And, um, right. and we've uh, been entering in, uh, in um, some uh, festivals. We've, we've entered it into a couple of festivals already. And uh, I won't say which yet, <laughs> uh, but uh, yes. Um, 
Will it, will it be released like on PBS or Netflix or any? Well, we're, we're prayerful and hopeful. <laughs> and uh, my uh, uh, partner on it is a producer director, Anthony Warham, and he is fantastic. And um, we came together um, um, through a mutual friend um, because Anthony was looking to do something uh, on James Hemming. And uh, the mutual friend said, oh, Ashbell's working on the same thing. So we got together. We've done this documentary. We're very proud of it. It's the first step. But I am in the process of uh, writing a screenplay um, for an, an episodic documentary on James Hemming's life. And, uh, and I feel that people uh, will actually um, enjoy that because, uh, you know, on Netflix, the uh, Bridgerton um, is, a, is a big hit. Well, this is the American Bridgerton. This is the American Bridgerton. And, uh, and I am, you know, very excited to be working on that screenplay. It sounds great. How, how, um... How long does the documentary run? It, the documentary is 60 minutes. It's an hour. And, um, and it no, will... It we, will could, be, we, could, we could run it at the club. Oh, well, this is a good thing. We're, I'm going to be the guy and we could standing do it this out way. on the corner going, over this, here! Yeah, no, it's no, no. over here! And we could, run it th we could run it through Zoom because our audience is international in scope. Well, I so just um, a thought, just a thought. I am, Laura, I'm, I'm looking at every single blessing that comes our way. <laughs> All right, that sounds terrific. Um, let me just check to see if there are any more questions. Everyone was very fascinated. I have to be, it's just great. It's, oh. it's a fascinating story. All right, and uh, the, the, the last question is, can you please tell us more about your culinary school? How many students are enrolled and how is the curriculum designed? Well, the curriculum, the curriculum has been designed by uh, Latoya Meagers, who is a director with the uh, uh, James Hemming Society. Mm -hmm. And she's had a lot, she's a chef and educator. She's um, run cooking schools and um, and it was her passion to um, to start to teach kids and um, and the response has been incredible so we're uh, she's she's finally developing um, the the fine points but uh, she couldn't be here today because she's actually teaching a class <laughs> um, so um, I am thrilled that uh, um, that we're, you know, championing this initiative for six to fourteen-year-olds and six to eighteen-year-olds, and uh, um, it's it's very timely. And um, um, she's 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 terrific, and has put this in place so that uh, you know it, they're they're actually in class now as we speak so okay. i'm very excited about that it sounds it sounds wonderful well you will have to keep us all updated on everything so um this was terrific let me see now we have a look some more time if there are another question let's see what we have here oh <laughs> well everyone seems to like uh, my suggestion that we run the documentary on. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, we're, we're keeping it on. <laughs> right. So, um, Doug, um, unmute and let's see your face. Doug. Doug. There we go. All right. So. Thank um, you so much, Ashbell. That was really, really wonderful. It was really great. Ashbel, thank you so much. Everyone was so enlightened. And it's well, about thank time you. to I totally thank enjoyed Doug. it. Thank you. I totally enjoyed it. And Doug, thank you so much, my friend, for the invitation. Okay. Well, Ashbel, I only have one question. When's dinner? <laughs> When's dinner? <laughs> Soon come, Doug. Soon come. I know, right? So um yeah. to everybody watching.
thank you so much um, for um, watching tonight. Um, as I said, it'll be on the NAC's YouTube channel within 24 hours, probably by tomorrow afternoon. So you can watch it again, or just please tell your friends because this is a very important story and not enough people, not enough people know about it. So I charge all of you to at least let one person know about James Hemmings. Oh, um, Laura, thank you what? for that. Does that work? That, that, that is work? wonderful that's because good. that's how it starts, okay? So, um, so everybody have a terrific evening. And um, again, thanks, thanks for coming. And thank you, Ash Bell and Doug. Thank, thank you, you so all. Thank, thank you, you all very much. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye, Ash Bell. Bye-bye.